Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Larry Laderman, your MC for this evening. This is the fifth session in a series sponsored by the Center for International Governance and Innovation, or CG, which is located in Waterloo, Ontario. I'm delighted to see so many members of the Ottawa diplomatic community here, as well as members of parliament, the government, and those representing the academic, business, and cultural communities of Ottawa, and especially uh, recognize Catherine White, the president of the United Nations, Nations Association of Ottawa and her colleagues. And now it is my pleasure to ask the former president of the North-South Institute, institution and the and IDRC, and currently the president of the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement and member of the CG Operating Board, Maureen O'Neill, to introduce our panel. Maureen. Thank you very much, Larry. Actually, I'm introducing Barry, who's introducing the panel. So welcome to tonight's Global uh, Policy Forum. I think that our title, Squaring the Circle, the Millennium Development Goals, post-2015, acknowledges the complexities to be addressed by our dedicated and imaginative panel. Barry has an extensive background in public policy, both domestic social and economic policy, as well as foreign policy. Going right back, he joined uh, the Treasury Board in 1971, uh, I think during what could be described as the heyday of the attempt to have evidence-based public policy making. And he joined Treasury Board following the completion of his PhD in economics at Brown University. Barry's experienced in both the central agency, life in central agencies, and also in line departments, as well as in foreign policy, having covered there international economic policy as Sue Sherpa for the G7 and G8, trade policy, a member of the OECD Executive Committee, and as High Commissioner to Singapore. He has been the Associate Director of the Center for Global Studies at the University of Victoria and is an adjunct professor there. Since 2003, he's been working with CG, and since 2009, as a senior fellow. Now he co-directs a joint initiative, this joint initiative, between CG and the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies to explore and recommend future directions for international development beyond the 2015 UN Millennium Development Goals. And I'm sure that you will appreciate his skillful, incisive analysis and robust sense of humor, as do I. Barry. Well, thank you very much for that, that, that kind introduction. Um, as as uh, Maureen mentioned, uh, I just have to give you a disclaimer at the beginning, because my education is in economics. <clears throat> You know, when, when, uh, when God uh, created the world, first thing he did was he created uh, the sun. But the devil was there, and the devil uh, created sunburn. Uh, God's reaction was, okay, uh, I'll create marriage. And the devil created divorce. Now, God realized he had a worthy opponent, so he thought a little while, and he, uh, he created an economist. And then the devil's response, after some thought, was to create two economists. <laughs> <clears throat> In any case, I, I just have about uh, five minutes, so uh, I just want to say a couple of things. Uh, all of you can read uh, faster than, than I can speak. Uh, so there were two documents put on uh, each of the chairs. One's a page and a half summary of uh, where we've come out. And there's a, a little more substantive report that uh, describes our journey and, and gives you a little indication of uh, some of the indicators. But basically, <clears throat> the, the, the message uh, we wanted to make was that, uh, that we wanted to provide was that goals matter. Goals provide incentives. And we put together a process, uh, Mukesh, uh, starting uh, two and a half years ago in Geneva with the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, joined by, shortly afterwards, by the Korean Development Institute. 
we put together a process where uh, we thought, okay, let's build on existing international agreements. Let's not break new ground in terms of uh, international conventions. Let's build on what's already been agreed. Uh, let's adapt to the changes since 2000, because there's a lot of uh, differences uh, in technology, just the location of poverty. There's a whole series of, uh, of changes. And let's address uh, some of the gaps uh, in, for which the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals, were criticized. Uh, they were on balance a great success, but people said, look, there are things that have to, had to be included in the next, uh, in the next generation. <clears throat> so looking at the, at the problem, we realized, well, first of all, uh, culture matters. And uh, if we're going to have, if we're going to create a menu of, of, of potential candidates for, uh, for post-2015 goals, it would be useful to have a series of partners. So we lined up partners in, in China, India, think tanks from China, India, Brazil, and South, uh, South Africa. And we had a series of, uh, of meetings, and uh, uh, our proposals evolved uh, through a series of about six or eight uh, meetings. We took, uh, we took our results to the United Nations uh, and the World Bank uh, last November. Again, in the spirit of, here's a menu, candidates. We're not trying to do your job for you. And then uh, we thought, after we delivered our messages, we thought that uh, last February, we had a meeting uh, in, in Bellagio uh, where we said, let's see if we can square the circle. Let's, let's assume that the UN Secretary General threw up his hands, that the member-led process was going to come to nothing. What would we recommend after having gone through this two, two and a half year uh, process? And indeed, we, th we thought it's a problem analogous to squaring a circle because we have to limit the number of goals. And there are hundreds of suggestions dozens of very serious suggestions, but the whole process won't work if you have more than eight or 10 goals. Some argue even eight is, uh, is too many. Uh, so you have to limit the number of goals. The goals have to be uh, measurable. So we, we said, okay, what has to happen is we've got to com come up with a list of indicators, and Mukesh will tell you a little bit more about indicators in a few moments. Uh, and we've got to choose those indicators from a list of uh, inputs, because sometimes inputs matter. Sometimes outputs, sometimes process matters. Sometimes you need an indicator for outcomes. Uh, and then we have to use this, the best available data uh, to measure progress, because measurement uh, is critical. And a lot of our effort was spent on coming up with uh, what, what do we do about, about the indicators? What are the best indicators? Because you know the statistics are like sausages. You like them better if you don't know what's in them. Uh, indices you'll like better if you don't know what the weights are for the various elements of, of uh, the indices. Uh, ratios are easier to work with if you ignore what's happening to changes in the denominator, perhaps. Um, but on balance, you know, we, our, 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 our suggestion is that, look, it's better to measure the right thing imprecisely rather than the wrong thing very precisely. Very, basically, it's, it's a very difficult squaring the circle problem, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'll tell you what our, our basic solution was. Uh, we thought, first of all, uh, instead of being goals for the bottom billion, we should have universal one-world goals that apply to everybody. Uh, second, we didn't think that the su sustainable development goals that came out of Rio Plus 20 should be a separate exercise. These have to be merged. Uh, third, the, the goals have to have some structure that focuses on individual capacities, much like the first few goals of the existing MDGs. But we also have to have stuff on collective human capital and something on enabling institutions. We, had a, we thought we had to have, have a structure. Then the other main difference we, we suggest from present practice is that targets should not be set globally. Individual countries, for them to have ownership, should select their own targets. There should be perhaps minimum global standards, but what that target is should be set by, uh, should be left to individual countries. Um, and similarly, uh, indicators have to be selected based on uh, what the capacity is in individual countries, because uh, Statistics Canada caliber institutions are not, uh, are not present uh, you know, in, in most countries in the world. Uh, then we wanted to 
change the focus of, uh, of the poverty dimension from uh, poverty eradication to inclusive growth, with the emphasis on inclusive. Because if we're talking about redistributing the pie uh, and there are going to be losers, if it's not going to be a win-win solution, uh, you're going to end up with uh, certainly opposition and, and, and not complete, uh, complete buy-in. Uh, on the, the back of uh, the one pager that we've given you are, uh, are our list of, of goals. We suggest 10. If, if we were in charge, we would suggest these 10. Uh, we have a few new ones uh, that weren't adequately treated in the MDGs. Um, we have new goals for uh, food and water, uh, which were food security and water. They were sort of subsumed in, in the poverty eradication, and they've got to be given more uh, visibility. Resilience of communities to natural disasters, to technological disasters. Um, a, new, uh, a new goal for security, uh, with not, not interstate, we're talking about personal uh, security of violence. Uh, something on infrastructure, We've got a, we called it connectivity, but we wanted more than uh, ICT, information communication technology, which is in the MDGs, we wanted stuff on electricity. People have to be connected. Uh, in terms of power, energy, um, and transportation as well. I think uh, I'll stop there. Let me introduce uh, my two panelists. They'll speak for a couple of minutes each. Uh, Diana Alarcon uh, will give you the, the bird's eye view, uh, or perhaps the inside view, rather, of uh, the United Nations. She's a senior uh, officer in the Department of Economic and Social Affairs. Uh, Dr. Alarcon, Diana Alarcon, uh, is at the the center of, of uh, the discussions of uh, how they're going to resolve uh, the conflicting advice they get from the many different processes that are underway in the United Nations at the present time, and she'll talk about that. And then uh, to instill uh, some electricity and some motion, some emotion into the uh, uh, into the discussion, we have Mukesh Kapila, uh, who uh, is our uh, most evangelical uh, member. <coughs> He's a former senior official of uh, running aid and humanitarian affairs for DFID in the UK. He was uh, been the UN uh, resident uh, coordinator uh, in the Sudan at the time of the Darfur uh, problems. And um, he's been a senior official uh, at the World Health Organization uh, as well um, as well as currently being a professor at the University of Manchester. So Diana, if you'll speak for perhaps five minutes. Thank you, Barry. Um, and thank you for the invitation to be with you. It's always um, very exciting coming to Canada to discuss with uh, you people, a very uh, generous country, to the rest of the world. So it's always very exciting to, uh, to come and discuss with uh, Canadians issues around uh, global development. Um, unlike Barry, I am not allowed to talk about goals or targets for specific areas. This is a very contentious uh, issue right now. Obviously, um, all the processes that are taking place right now around the discussion of the post-2015 development agenda uh, is, uh, very, is, is very active, is generating a lot of initiatives, and we in the UN as a secretariat to this discussion, we are taking note, we are uh, helping out, providing technical assistance to the process, but we are not at the time of uh, defining a development agenda, not even, not even close to that. So what I will uh, perhaps um, start with is uh, a little bit of the, um, the processes, uh, various processes that are taking place in the United Nations. As you know, in 2015 is the, uh, the uh, target year for the culmination of the Millennium Development Goals. And the discussion about what is going to replace the Millennium Development Goals right now is very active. Uh, you remember also uh, last year during the conference in Rio, the Conference on Sustainable Development, uh, governments decided to initiate a broad process of discussion on the Sustainable Development Goals. That is an, an agenda, a, a, a set of goals that would bring more balance to development, that would incorporate uh, issues related to, to the economy, to social development, to environmental sustainability in a more balanced way. 
uh, the assessment that they were making is uh, the MDGs, even though they have MDG 7, which uh, reflects issues uh, in relation to environmental sustainability, it is not enough. We are consuming our natural resources uh, way faster that, than they can be replaced at this point. So setting up uh, goals on human development issues, on poverty, on uh, improving health, on education, nowadays is not enough. We need a much more ambitious agenda that will also incorporate incorporate a uh, concern for the sustainability in the use of natural resources. So member states initiated uh, a very active uh, discussion right now taking place as we speak in the United Nations. There is uh, an open working group of, um, of governments uh, discussing what could be how to define this limited set of sustainable development goals in a way that are going to balance the three dimensions of development, economic, social, and environmental sustainability. At the same time, uh, there are so many other processes that are doing consultations and are bringing ideas to the table about what could be a global development agenda post 2015. And in that, in relation to this, uh, the UN has been supporting around 70 countries, mostly developing countries, that are doing national consultations. And these are broad national consultations about what do people want in a future global development agenda. And we can talk a little bit about uh, a global development agenda vis-a-vis -vis national development agendas, because I think at this point, this distinction is going to be very, very important to make sure that the discussion is heading in the right direction. <coughs> uh, but this is something that we can probably entertain later on in relation to, to questions. Um, so, uh, the UN system itself is very actively engaged in producing analytical inputs into this discussion, and there are several uh, reports and pieces, uh, technical pieces that uh, we are putting together. And then there is a series, probably hundreds of processes and consultations from civil society, both in developed and developing countries, hundreds of processes outside of the UN system without support from the UN system, but much more uh, energetic and actively engaged into the discussion about what should replace the, uh, the Millennium Development Goals. So as you can tell, and I will leave it here because I'm sure there is going to be a more uh, interesting interaction after, after these introductory remarks, but with what I have said, you can imagine the difficult task that UN uh, member states are going to have. Not us UN bureaucrats, but member states will have a very hard time in, uh, in the run to, uh, post, uh, to 2015 to make sure, one, that the challenges of development are reflected in the, into the new agenda, that there is a good selection of development priorities for the next uh, 15 to 20 years, that we have captured the voices of people who are participating in this dialogue, and that we end up with a global agenda that has a limited number of goals that is concise, that is easy to communicate, and that will help to drive development in a good direction. It's going to be a very difficult process, and here we are to discuss it. Barry introduced me as an evangelist. Fortunately, he didn't uh, say for which religion, uh, but uh, when Martin Luther King got up one morning, and he said, I have a dream. You know, he could easily have said, I have a nightmare. Because actually what he did was he had a nightmare. But he said he had a dream, and that changed history. So the fundamental challenge for 2015 frameworks is not the driest and most boring of arguments about goals and targets and indicators, but a question of vision. And the contribution of the post-2015 development framework is whether or not it can help to shape a shared aspiration, a joint vision, and hence provide hope and inspiration for, for the world. 
And for me, certainly, I think that's the fundamental test of it, in a way. Will, in the 1990s, when the whole current MDG process started, and that's when I also began a particular phase of my professional career, and I was involved in designing the current MDGs, because I was at that time in London and uh, part of the British government contributions and such like. So very familiar with the processes that took place at that moment in time. And it is a good process. A good, it's a good, it's a top-down technical process, but that's what you could do in those times. But, and by and large, uh, as I think Barry has mentioned, but maybe didn't emphasize enough, the framework has, the current MDG framework has done a good job and done a good service. So it provides us with a challenge to build on. So anything we do is, in a sense, uh, trying to do better, more, better, reach further than what the current framework uh, does. And the question is whether in doing that we do it in an incremental way or in a transformative way. In other words, do we kindly just fine tune it? Do we say, oh, well, we achieved this target and we didn't do that, uh, and maybe a little bit of this and a little bit of salt and a bit of spice and add a bit of chili here and uh, kind of take away some this and that and uh, so on. Or we can really reflect on the successes and failures of development journey so far. And successes are well known. I don't need to, uh, to, to say them. And there's nothing I say is to take away from those successes. But the, more, the lessons we learned is not from where we have succeeded, but where we have failed. And it's sometimes in our kind of collective arrogance where we kind of celebrate more our successes and we try to whip up every little success as if it's some great evolution of human uh, endeavor. We're not honest enough in, the, in, in, in that. And so in reflecting back, I would say that we have to start from that particular perspective. The fact is that we live in an unequal world. The fact is that despite all the money thrown through aid programs, uh, we have a women giant dying in childbirth, which is an obscenity if ever there was one. We have a, a technology, resources, and everything you need to do this, but we haven't achieved it. And the reason is not because you haven't thrown enough money at it, but because you fundamentally not changed the system. So the development framework for the post-2015 Whatever technical contribution it makes, it must fundamentally change the way we think about our world. I am a little bit concerned that the current leaders who are working on this, and you may not say this because you're in the UN, I can say this because I'm no longer in the UN and I'm no longer in government, but I don't see much ambition coming out in content terms of the current triumvirate of uh, David Cameron uh, Liberian and, and uh, Indonesian presidents, and that's a tragedy. That's sad. This meeting is important because Canada and Canadians and those who are not Canadians but who are part of this journey here and, and live in Canada, they need to add their voice. Otherwise, you will get the development framework that you get through neglect, in a way. The development framework we need for post-2015 has got to be ambitious. It is not about dealing, uh, dealing just with, uh, with, with vulnerability and so on. It's got to ask the questions. Why are people fundamentally poor? And if it doesn't address that, the cross-cutting factors, enabling factors, as Barry called it, then I think we have failed. And never before, in the context of the changes and global aspirations and the, and the way globalization is occurring and the flow of information resources and the way ideas are connecting and revolutions are taking place of the mind physically and all the rest of it, we have a, globe, we have a historic opportunity to bring about that, that change. So that would be the way I would, I would say this. I think Barry has already covered the, in, uh, the debate on uh, national and international. We need a global framework, but we need national applicable ownership, and therefore that means uh, being able to uh, provide things in a way that makes sense at, at a local and national level. And I think we need to do this particularly to, uh, uh, to harness, uh, in particular, the uh, advances of technology in terms of measurement science, and he mentioned indicators and targets. And how we choose indicators and targets is hugely important, because what you measure is, uh, is, is what, you get, uh, what you get. Let me stop there, because I think uh, the discussion that we would like to have is basically unpack these statements and go into greater detail. Um, why, don't you, uh, why don't you say a word about, uh, about indicators? One of the issues is you know, we really believe that uh, measurement is critical. Uh, it's, it's useless to have 
aspirational goals, stretch goals, unless you can measure uh, your progress. If we have the kind of goals that Mukesh is looking at, they're going to be very, they're going to be ambitious. So if it's true that, um, you know, the, the cliche, tell me uh, what you're going to measure, tell me what you're going to measure, I'll tell you how I'm going to behave. Uh, if, if measurement is really critical for some of these aspirational goals, uh, what's the prospects for, uh, for indicators? Would you say something about uh, thermometers, perhaps? Yeah. Well, I think um, uh, the good news is that actually measurement sciences, sciences has advanced a great deal, both in terms of uh, capacities built up for the collection of information and uh, the rise in uh, kind of uh, comparability of information. You know, that's been one of the positive stories of the investment made in the MDGs, in a way, collecting data, and the UN is particularly good at uh, helping countries to do and report. And that has meant, uh, you know, progress. And today's indicators, uh, and I think Barry mentioned, and, but let me emphasize, we're not here talking just about impact indicators, because sometimes when you embark on a journey, uh, you can measure where you reach the end of the journey by seeing if you reach your destination. But what's more interesting is, is experience along the way, and development is one of those journeys uh, in a way. So process indicators and input indicators are as important as the impact indicators, uh, uh, really. And, and here also we, there's a bit of confusion because people confuse indicators and targets. Uh, and we have to be very clear what we're talking about. And an indicator by itself is neutral. You know, like for example, uh, he mentioned temperature, like you know, one's temperature, that's just a measurement. Whether or not one is hot-blooded or cold-blooded in temperature terms is a, a value-laden target you can set to raise the world's temperature or lower the world's temperature. I mean, not in climate change terms, I mean in, you know, other, in other terms, you see. So what we have to do, is to ensure that indicators, using the best of measurement science that we have without going into abstruse technical detail, are ones that can apply to all countries. So whether you're applying these, indica in these indicators in, in China, Canada, or Cameroon, they're the same indicators. But the targets that are set can vary. And the other, but probably you'll say, but China is very different, Canada and Cameroon is even more different, and what, are you, what am I talking here about? So what we will, what we, got here in the document is a basket of indicators, meaning a range of uh, ways by which one might measure, and then let each country in its own context decide which of them make sense uh, to it. And that gives the necessary flexibility that we need. Uh, Diana, if a, you, you mentioned there's this uh, maze uh, of processes underway in, in terms of uh, providing input to the UN. Uh, if a Canadian uh, individual or an organization <clears throat> is really um, uh, sincere about having uh, s some very constructive ideas, where's the acupuncture point? Uh, what should they do to deliver their, uh, their messages or their views uh, to, un to optimize the, ch the chance that they'll be heard and effect be effective? Um. At this point, there are so many acupuncture points that uh, almost any entry point will make sure to, uh, to, to be heard and to be part of these debates. And Canadians have been very, very successful in participating in this debate. Last time I was here in Ottawa was precisely to participate in one of these consultations, national consultations of Canadians about the post-2015. Almost any process that I just listed to you, the um, national consultations, the thematic consultations, there is an online pr uh, process of consultations, the high-level panel, uh, the discussion that, that is taking place among member states in the UN, they all have a uh, process of consultation with the stakeholders, with civil society, with the private sector, with academia, with experts, etc. So it depends on what are the issues of interest, in the, it depends on where you are, are uh, the, um, uh, the processes where you can participate. If you only have access to one computer, there is something that is called uh, the, the world we want. And this is an, an online process of consultation where you can participate in many of the debates that are taking place. So there are several. Um, we are not short of uh, consultation processes. Let me just, if I may, say one word about the importance of, indicate, of indicators. And um, 
the the importance of coming up with the with the right indicators and the right number of indicators as well. We don't want a limited number of goals with a, an, a very large list of indicators because that would be, uh, you know, just bringing the indicators uh, through through the window. Um, producing data and producing indicators is not a problem. Many of the issues that we have in the MDGs could not be measured in the year 2000. Now we can measure them better, employment being one of them. So producing information is not a problem as long as there is political will to mobilize the resources and to implement the policies towards those indicators. So I, I would say, Yes, that data is very important, and we in the UN are the first ones to say we need good data to monitor, we need a very clear monitoring framework, but what is most important in this very ambitious agenda, and if it is going to be a transformative agenda, what we need is a political will to uh, activate the kind of transformation that will lead us on a more sustainable pathway. And that's what we are testing this time around. That was the panel discussion, and now the panel members are open to questions. And uh, Colleen has the mic, so uh, who would like to be the first person to ask a question? Barry, in your talk, you talked about basics like food and water, um, and you said you were going to enlarge upon this in the next. Do you want to talk a bit more about what you mean, transportation, storage? These things are all vital to achieving, sort of raising goals, but I wonder... <laughs> We got we got a, a package of them in the, in, in the back uh, uh, here. If you if you take a look uh, on page uh, 15, you can read them faster than, than uh, I can uh, speak to it. But um, one of the things I didn't say was it, it's critical uh, to be able to disaggregate any of these indicators. We talk about the importance of indicators. Disaggregation is critical. Probably that's uh, true uh, more so in terms of food and, and water than anywhere else. Because if uh, at a national level there's plenty of food, but the lowest quintile is, uh, is uh, starving, that's, uh, that's no help. So you want, you want that uh, very, very clear. Um, we also wanted it uh, disaggregated by gender. Uh, because uh, if you just do household adequacy, uh, it may not be distributed equally uh, within the household. One, one of the other things I, uh, I'd like to say is when I started on, on this process, uh, I was very, very suspicious of uh, indicators, you know, because of my, my suspicion of statistics uh, and data in, generally, in general, and, and the fact that we often use uh, ratios, and you know the joke about uh, ratios, uh, the, the Wizard of Ids uh, uh, knight came uh, to the king and said, look, uh, I've got this great plan to have crime in the streets, and the king's really interested. What, what should I do? He said, you double the number of streets. Um, so when you're, when you're given a ratio, you know, uh, things may be looking good, but, uh, you know, in terms of the prevalence of, of poverty, but the absolute number in the numerator may be rising. So ratios, I was very suspicious of, uh, and that goes through for any of these, uh, you know, these indicators on page 15 here of, for, for food and water. Uh, similarly, uh, Indices, you know, there are indexes for all kinds of things. Uh, <clears throat> planetary boundaries. There's a global footprint index. You know, when it's very, very difficult when you when you uh, when you study it to try and find out exactly what, how robust is, is it? What's the sensitivity if uh, if we change these arbitrary weights that are not transparent at all? Um, but basically, you know, we would we would stick with uh, with stunting. We would want to we would worry about the the question of stunting. Uh, there's a, an index that I, I would accept on a food consumption score. And the other thing uh, we should say is um, we were convinced by the former chief statistician of, of South Africa that we shouldn't turn our nose up at surveys. Mm. I've often been uh, totally uh, off on, on uh, surveys, all because of that wonderful Yes Minister program years ago, which demonstrated, you know, depending what setup questions you ask. This was the National Service uh, Questionnaire. If anybody's not familiar with that, see me after the session and I'll, I'll get you the, the link. 
But you know, depending how you ask the question, you can you can get the answer uh, you want. But the former chief statistician of uh, of South Africa, uh, Mark Orkin, who uh, participated in our group for the last several meetings, uh, was adamant that, uh, and based on his experience in Africa, working in 40 or 45 different countries in Africa, that you can do household surveys. And so we would want household surveys done on uh, adequacy of, of, of food and water. Water is a very difficult question because water for some people means sanitation. So maybe it belongs in the infrastructure because that's part of infrastructure. Or maybe it means um, uh, agriculture, irrigation. Other, for other people, it means uh, drinking water. Um, for others, it's interstate uh, conflicts. So that's a, a difficult one, which we don't really know uh, where to put. So we didn't. We we answered many of the questions, but there are still some that are uh, are unanswered. Blair, I used to work for Cedar under the World Bank, but now I suppose I'm associated with the North South Institute. But I'm not Kate. Um, what I wanted to talk about really was a little bit about the the politics of the MDGs and some and how we move forward from here. I mean. We all know they've been a great success in many ways, but they've also had very great vulnerabilities. And one of them was that we didn't know how to essentially implement them. We meaning donors like myself, donors like yourself. And so what happened was that a lot of the effort that developing countries, the people in developing countries wanted to put in place were not appreciated when they were either measured or were they given any capacity to perform. And I'm interested in your thoughts around that issue. And I put it in the context of something which I'm glad to hear you mention, Barry, is one of the things that you're talking about, which is universality. And the need, therefore, to have a set of goals that everybody is achieving to. So you don't have this invidious reality that Paul Lesuto can't manage things, but Canada doesn't even bother to be counted because we're too, too well off and too, too well endowed. And I think that measure, the political measure of universality is a very, very critical one. And I hope that that's there when we finally get to this, because I think that's very, very important for the MDGs to succeed. But I'm also uneasy about one dimension, which I've also been writing about, and I'll sort of give you the link to it if you want, Barry. And that is the question of how do you have appropriate targets for groups of countries? Because I hear the measure, with the, men the message saying, since it's so embarrassing that we're trying to make Lesotho be the same as Canada, we will therefore let them choose their own goals. And that really leaves them with a problem that there is no sense of performance measures for different categories of countries, low-income countries, fragile states, middle-income countries, developed countries like our own. And it's that framework, I think, to me, we also have to start to think about, because otherwise we will have the same frustration all over again. Those that are well endowed will be successful, and those that are under, under endowed and neglected will be unsuccessful. And I think that's something we have to avoid in this next generation of MDGs. And of course, the link to the SDGs, which is critical. I would suggest a way forward, uh, which is listed in this paper, is that one offers people a constrained choice. In other words, clearly indicators and targets, there has to be flexibility according to the context that you're in, and according to political judgments you wish to uh, make. I mean, in the end, it's for a country to decide what level of development it's willing to work for. And it's for the country's citizens to determine whether they want the government to be more or less uh, uh, ambitious in a way. You can't sort of impose that from the top. It doesn't work uh, in such a way. So hence, I think the indicators must be universal meaning the ways we, after all, there's no middle level country or a higher income country way of measuring temperature. You know, we know how to measure temperature. It's the same old temperature, you see. But it is true that uh, some indicators may be more or less relevant to certain groups of countries according to the particular context. That may not be for economic categorization. It may be landlocked countries. It may be uh, countries with an existentialist threat against them, like uh, uh, the rising sea levels or, or uh, you know, uh, so on and so forth, uh, really. Well, see, there was another well, point, I, wasn't it? But uh, I mean, is it is it clear where where we're coming from? We want to have uh, a universal global goal. Uh, we want to have a universal set of indicators that uh, measure progress towards the goal. But the idea is that the only way to get country ownership is uh, to let them choose 
the target, the, the, the level of that indicator that they're, they're going to aspire to. Uh, and in a, uh, you know, we'll wave a magic wand and we'll say, okay, there's going to be a, uh, some minimum global standards so nobody can zero out on, on, on something. But the idea with to try, trying to square the circle is to say, okay, we're not going to tell Cameroon that they have to have the same level of graduate education as, uh, as Canada. I think the other point, if I may add, which I forgot the first point, is that We've tried very hard to talk about one world goals and not development goals. Unfortunately, the world and uh, you know, those of us who are in the development business, we tend to think this is a business of development ministries. It isn't. The contribution of aid to development is marginal. And I think the discussion should not be about levels and volumes of aid. It's some countries are too preoccupied with that, reaching to 0 0.7 and so on. Probably you will disagree with me, Diana. Uh, but the point here is that a whole of government approach is needed and a whole of society approach is needed. This is not a set of goals designed for aid officials. This is not for CEDA. Right. This is not for DFID. You know, because most development takes place outside the aid industry, like most health takes place outside hospitals. Just a very brief point, uh, a very uh, simple point here, just to say, from the conversations we hear in the different processes, but uh, also within the UN in the uh, this open working group pro uh, process that I was telling you about, uh, there is uh, more or less a consensus building in the sense that there are groups of countries that will have to be singled out or their needs will have to be addressed in a special way. In a way, we did have it already with the MDGs, less developed countries, hippie countries, where uh, seeds were mentioned as a special groups of countries. This time around, we hear LDCs, landlocked developing countries, seeds, countries in conflict and post-conflict situations will need a special assistance, and it has to be addressed in the post-2015 uh, uh, framework. And the other thing I wanted to say very, very quickly is, uh, I think it is very important to keep in mind what the role of a global development agenda should be. A global development agenda is not an exhaustive uh, listing or an exhaustive illustration of the development challenges of a specific countries. It is one way to point to a direction, to catalyze uh, collective action on issues that are of collective importance for the, uh, for, for the, for, for the countries in the world it is a point of reference to then uh, define your own development strategies. It is a tool for advocacy for citizens in their countries to advocate for uh, development priorities. So in a sense, indicators for a global agenda should be, should be that, should be global indicators that are monitored globally, but the intention is not to translate those mechanically as a uh, national development strategies and goals and targets that need to be achieved by every single country. I mean, each country will have its own context and each country will have to address its own development challenges with the indicators that feed their needs and their objectives, we think. And this is now uh, off the record. Thank you very much for that, and thank you very much for this effort. Uh, um, uh, Mukesh and, and I go a very long way back on looking at these issues. Um, I think one of the cautions that I would put to you, especially that we're here in the, the Ottawa environment, is the engagement of donor countries. So yes, it's fine to say it's, you know, it's, it's more than about aid, but this is also very important, and without letting you think I've somehow drunk the Kool-Aid, we, we certainly have to find a way to have other donors engaged in this. Um, I think that uh, in, in some ways we also need I think increasing coherence on the on the the debate. So, for example, there is not a national consultation in Canada, and in fact, the the groups that have uh, that have uh, explored this and are pushing it forward, including UNA Canada. I'm looking at my uh, colleague Julia and uh, and and Kate. Um, haven't been able to, for example, reach to um, the poor. I mean, that's certainly who our partners are at uh, UNA Canada to have the conversations with them. And I think that that's important. And I, I just like you to give me some, some feedback on that. But likewise, our relationship on these issues used to be sort of concessionary. 
you know, we're a privileged country, uh, you know, we ought to contribute, including our intellectual capital as well as our cold hard cash and resources. Um, that's, in fact, I used to say, we, you know, we talk about the Stockholm Syndrome, which is that even uh, Sweden, by the way, is reducing its investment in development, as, as you know. And so these things, we do have to take them together in a package as we look to the future on this. So this is sort of beyond politics to say, you know, where are those points and who else needs to be at the table as, as, you know, as opposed to just the usual suspects and making sure that they're engaged. And I, I also am going to mention my world because I think it's, a, it's an easy, accessible way that anybody can add comments to the, uh, to the UN dialogue. One of the amusing things uh, Mukesh and I found <coughs> when um, we were first thinking about this, uh, this project <coughs> in uh, 2010, I think, uh, was that <coughs> it, this big process was going to have a process was going to have to be developed. So why don't we find out what poor people think? <clears throat> why don't we devise a really clever uh, proposal that would we'd basically get the tele telecoms companies uh, around the world to help us so that we could uh, really uh, access what the objects of poverty erad eradication uh, policy. Uh, what they think, what do they want, and uh, without exception, and we we're uh, I'd, I'd like to say perhaps not skilled, but rather experienced uh, grant seekers. Uh, we visited uh, quite a few donors, and we're told without exception, why would you want to do that? We know what they think, we know what they're going to say, and in any case. Do you really think you'd get something different from uh, the huge exercise, Voices of the Poor? <clears throat> In any case, whether or not you think it's, it's uh, well, one other thing I should say in terms of an interesting observation, when we went to, to the UN and we talked about having one world goals, uh, the ambassador, uh, the permanent representative of Bangladesh to the, to the UN was very upset because he perceived that what we were doing was we were changing something which was focused on the ODA, on development assistance, uh, for which the, the prime customers, the prime, the, the raison d'etre for the thing was, was poor countries, and now you're, you're diluting the effort and the energy, and he was, was, was quite displeased. Uh, <clears throat> we, we always uh, resorted to another cliche, which is that the perfect is the enemy of the good. Um, What's important, I think, in, in our list of 10 goals is that virtually every uh, very poor country would agree that each of the elements on the list uh, is critical. And remember what the MDGs did was that they were sort of the, uh, the critical uh, determinant of, of if you couldn't get your project aligned with one of the MDGs, you were less likely to get, get financed. So all of our things here, uh, you know, each of our recommendations, I think, uh, fit perfectly well uh, in that uh, in that rubric, work, working uh, from a development perspective. And for most developed countries, all of them would agree, except the United States, that um, all ten of these things, these objectives apply to uh, to their country. I think the U.S. would would only reject equitable rules, you know, because they like to have a veto at the IMF and. Uh, they and a few other countries like to have vetoes at, uh, at, at the UN, and that's not going to be, be changed. I think I'll stop there. Uh, I'd just like to hear all of your comments on, on um, the likelihood that the, the edifice built around one world goals is going to stand. Um, you, you mentioned uh, a southern reaction, which I might Anticipated, and certainly there's a northern reaction, which I will, in, will anticipate. I mean, I look forward to how the Canadian government will respond to um, sanitation and nutrition um, standards uh, 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 measured carefully by community in this country. Um, and uh, I would be interested in hearing um, uh, from the panel as to whether you think this idea, which, by the way, I wholeheartedly endorse, I think it's a wonderful idea, um, will it fly? I, I think uh, I'm not sure what the, op what the alternative is. You see, uh, 
if we don't have some kind of a, <coughs> a inspirational uh, framework which uh, treats the world in an equitable manner, not dividing the world up as rich and poor, developed and developing. Because remember, today poverty exists not in the least developed countries. Most poverty is actually in the middle income countries. And instability is not just a factor of post-conflict states. There are in unstable and fragile populations in, in uh, many, many countries. And uh, we see this, and, and people slip in and out of poverty, people slip in and out of insecurity. So genuinely, we are in a very different world when I think nobody can claim uh, particular arrogance. You can have a richness of resources in Canada, but if you have poverty of ideas, then uh, you're poorer than those countries which are the other, other way around. And so, uh, it, I mean, I don't, it doesn't really matter what the Canadian government, uh, what it thinks, uh, uh, to be quite honest, because the Canadian government cannot be allowed to hold the rest of the world hostage. This is with due respect to my Canadian hosts. The point is the world outside is asking this. So it's irrelevant, quite honestly, what Canada thinks. In the same way, it's irrelevant what individual countries think. I'm making a point here, you see. The train is moving on. These are the, what we've heard when we t talk and consult you know, uh, out there. And no country can be allowed to say, oh, well, because it doesn't quite figure our little ideological thing, or maybe it's, uh, we, it's about aid or not about aid, et cetera, et cetera. So move on. I think it's going to happen. Uh, we may argue about some of the, uh, some of the language uh, in a way, but our consultations have indicated that out there, there is actually a huge popular consensus behind it. The challenge for the UN and the leaders who will kindly have to bring it uh, in the end together is going to be whether or not they're going to dumb it down uh, to, in the political horse trading, which inevitably happens. Hence, I press for the inspirational agenda because, you know, political negotiations, they always dumb things down. But if you dumb things down too much, then they, they're going to go to the rock flow. That's why I'm always lifting us, uh, you know, uh, lifting us up. But if, for example, the formula we finally achieve is not satisfactory, then uh, there will be alternative ways. This is what, what I'm saying, and this is new, uh, you know, is that if uh, the UN... Uh, process doesn't lead to an outcome which matches the right level of ambition, the right level of universality, and the right thing, then there will be others. And the UN and working through this approach is not the only way to solve the world's uh, problems. Uh, and that's the real challenge you know, for, for the UN. I don't know whether I'm clear or not. Uh. Let, let me, if I may, can I add just one very yes, brief yes. point to this? Because we have two more uh, questions, and that will be it. Just very briefly, uh, the fact that we have now a process that has incorporated formally the discussion of environmental sustainability means that the agenda has to be global. I mean, there is no way to address climate change uh, questions if it is not through a global agenda. So, in that sense the discussion is leading to the definition of a global agenda. The next question is, what will be the level of ambition? And second, what will be the level of commitment to reach those global goals? Which is going to be the most important question, of, of course. But everything, everything seems to indicate at this point that we are up to a global, universally applicable agenda. Thank you. Uh, Liliana Camacho, I'm with Environment Canada. Um, Diana, you alluded to more so than indicators being a problem in data, uh, political will. And I was just wondering if you had seen uh, progress between the first set of MDG goals and, and now when we're talking about the next set of MDG goals, uh, as well as in your opinion, what do you think the biggest barriers are to achieving political will, I suppose, goodwill, uh, and how, how we could overcome them? Okay. Political will. Political will. Uh, okay. In terms of data and indicators, this is probably where the most progress has been made. The greatest contribution of the MDGs, I think, is in the uh, area of yes. statistics and, and the use of statistics and indicators to monitor policy. So there is no question that was, that was the greatest achievement prob probably of the MDGs. On MDG achievement, obviously, you have a very mixed... Uh, picture. There are countries that were very fast in achieving a lot of these MDGs. There are countries that have achieved most of them. And there is obviously very slow progress in some countries. Com countries afflicted, afflicted by, conf uh, by conflict. For, for countries afflicted by country, by okay. conflict. Thank you. This is <laughs> um, and this is just only on the water. Just yeah. on the water. <laughs> it's, it's going to get worse. Um, 
they, no country afflicted by country achieved any MDG, any target, right? So the, the uh, picture is very mixed, but the contribution of the MDGs overall, we think, was very important. And it was very important in the sense of um, catalyzing efforts towards a set of priorities, well-identified priorities. Nowadays, there is no government that will win elections in a developing country without addressing issues of poverty, for example, without addressing issues of gender equality, without addressing many of the issues that were part of the MDGs. If only that we achieved with the MDGs, they were a great success because they are now part of the public discourse, of, of the public concern, and citizens are concerned about them and they are putting pressure on governments to uh, activate actions towards. Development is very complicated, it's a process, everybody says that, but in that sense, we think the MDG agenda was successful. I'll just say a word on that. One of the things you should you should take a look at is uh, the trends in some of the the global polling on uh, on populations' attitudes towards uh, climate change. For example, is one of the, the critical environmental problem. <clears throat> um, in in general, uh, with the blip from the financial crisis, uh, environment is always there. Climate change is always there as an important issue. One of the but it's never the most important issue. Uh, and uh, in particular, one example that, that, that struck me was a very clear poll done last, uh, last fall by Lao Institute in Australia, where the population absolutely did not want any measures, carbon taxes or, uh, or cap and trade uh, programs that might affect jobs, you know, overwhelmingly against. <clears throat> Do they think climate change is a serious problem? Yes. Would they like action taken on climate change? Yes. So it's another squaring the circle problem where we have to find uh, some way uh, that that will convince the public that uh, we're not going to have wholesale losses of jobs if, if, we, uh, if we address the problem because the political will will, uh, will follow uh, what the public thinks. Uh, one last question. And remember, we'll have a reception afterwards, so you'll have an opportunity to with members of the panel, and they promised me to answer your questions. <laughs> so, Margaret Scott. Margaret Scott, question. thank you very much. I was um, actually motivated to ask a question because of the issue raised on universality, as well as the issue of fundamental change. You can do much, you can throw money at a problem, as you said, but the question is fundamental change. Um, a few of us were privileged earlier today to listen to James Bartleman, our uh, First Nations Lieutenant Government governor of Ontario today, and um, clearly put some of the people in the room uh, ill at ease, but he spoke about the issues on reserves and off reserves for First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. And, the, and one of the questions that was, so I have a comment and a question. One of the questions was, what do you think about integration? Do you think we should have integration as a solution? Is that the fundamental change? And he said, that is a non-starter. He said, what is a starter? Because of the number of policies, attitudes, et cetera. He said, what is a starter, though, is education. And then somebody said, yes, but they get educated. They'll come to the city. They get a job. They go off reserve. And he goes, yes, but that's an individual choice. And, and so I, was, I see, of course, education and so academic and vocational are on the list. But in terms of edu uh, indicators and outputs, is it not beyond just the education, but actually yeah. access to new partners and jobs, because without jobs, there won't be fundamental change. Thank you so much. Um, I mean, that's why I think the world, uh, maybe this is a point to actually comment uh, on uh, the way the goals are worded, the candidate goals we propose. If you read them carefully, each of them is in two halves. You know, there is, for example, appropriate education and skills, and then it goes on for full participation in society. The implication, therefore, being is not education and skills that's the important thing, but it's the full participation in society for which education and skills is just a means towards an end. And the same is true for uh, everything, sufficient food and water for what? You know, for active living. And what is active living is a matter also of discretion and judgment, uh, according to whether you're 80 or, or 8, and it de all depends on and, uh, of so on and so forth. So you're right. I mean, you're absolutely right in raising those particular, particular issues. But this is where I think no framework can, in a sense, uh, give you a mathematical formula 
it is a question, and we're back to the question of political will, whether in reading into this framework you feel enabled to make choices, social choices, political choices, uh, solidarity choices. That's where aid comes in, the point Kate made uh, earlier on in terms of resource flows and so on. And that you cannot uh, kind of legislate under a global framework or even a national framework. But it provides a vision, it provides a framework, it provides as a, as a, as a way forward. I'm here to just briefly thank the panel, but incidentally along the way I also need to thank everyone in the room uh, because CG's mission as a research center into uh, international governance is to build bridges from knowledge to power for the sake of better policy globally. And that's the very point of our global policy forum series here in Ottawa. So today we heard from a knowledgeable and practical-minded economist who has spent the past three years uh, researching the post-2015 uh, development goals and uh, the report that you have in your chair, that 20-page squaring the circle, is really the culmination of a series of excellent uh, publications coming out of his project, that's Barry. Uh, we heard from a self-described UN bureaucrat who uh, helped us to see the MDGs as a catalyst for action, not a comprehensive list, and uh, who encouraged uh, all Canadians and people everywhere, really, to take advantage of the many entry points that the UN provides into this debate. And we heard from a, an expert and evangelist for global progress on the need to be ambitious and transformative in setting the goals. Uh, but most importantly, we also have an audience today of policy thinkers, policy makers, policy influencers, who can help extend these very good ideas into uh, the realm of practical implementation. So thanks to all of you, but also let's give a final uh, appreciation to our panelists. Next, uh, in the next generation. <clears throat> so looking at the, at the problem, we realize, well, first of all, uh, culture matters. And uh, if we're gonna have, if we're gonna create a menu of, of, of potential candidates for, uh, for post-2015 goals, it would be useful to have a series of partners. So we lined up partners in, in China, India, think tanks from China, India, Brazil, and South, uh, South Africa. And we had a series of, uh, of meetings, and uh, uh, our proposals evolved uh, through a series of about six or eight uh, meetings. We took, uh, we took our results to the United Nations uh, and the World Bank uh, last November. Again, in the spirit of, here's a menu, candidates. We're not trying to do your job for you. And then uh, we thought, after we delivered our messages, we thought that uh, last February we had a meeting uh, in, in Bellagio uh, where we said, let's see if we can square the circle. Let's, let's assume that the UN Secretary General threw up his hands, that the member-led process was going to come to nothing. What would we recommend after having gone through this two, two and a half year uh, process? And indeed, we, th we thought it's a problem analogous to squaring a circle because we have to limit the number of goals. And there are hundreds of suggestions, dozens of very serious suggestions, but the whole process won't work if you have more than eight or 10 goals. Some argue even eight is, uh, is too many. Uh, so you have to limit the number of goals. The goals have to be uh, measurable. So we, th we said, okay, what has to happen is we've got to com come up with a list of indicators and Mukesh will tell you a little bit more about indicators in a few moments. Uh, and we've got to choose those indicators from a list of uh, inputs because sometimes inputs matter. Sometimes outputs, sometimes process matters. Sometimes you need an indicator for output. Uh, created sunburn. Uh, God's reaction was, okay, uh, I'll create marriage. And the devil created divorce. Now, God realized he had a worthy opponent, so he thought a little while, and he, uh, he created an economist. <laughs> and then the devil's response, after some thought, was to create two economists. <laughs> <clears throat> In any case, I, I just have about uh, five minutes, so uh, I just want to say a couple of things. Uh, all of you can read uh, faster than, than I can speak, uh, so there were two documents put on uh, each of the chairs. One's a page and a half summary of uh, where we've come out. And there's a, a little more substantive report that uh, describes our journey and, and gives you a little indication of uh, some of the indicators. But basically, <clears throat> the, the, the message uh, we wanted to make was that, uh, that we wanted to provide was that goals matter. Goals provide incentives. 
And we put together a process, uh, Mukesh, uh, starting uh, two and a half years ago in Geneva with the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, joined by, shortly afterwards, by the Korean Development Institute. We put together a process where uh, we thought, okay, let's build on existing international agreements. Let's not break new ground in terms of uh, international conventions. Let's build on what's already been agreed. Uh, let's adapt to the changes since 2000, because there's a lot of uh, differences uh, in technology, just the location of poverty. There's a whole series of, uh, of changes. And let's address uh, some of the gaps uh, in, for which the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals, were criticized. Uh, they were, on balance, a great success, but people said, look, there are things that have to, had to be included in the... Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Larry Laderman, your MC for this evening. This is the fifth session in a series sponsored by the Center for International Governance and Innovation, or CG, which is located in Waterloo, Ontario. I'm delighted to see so many members of the Ottawa diplomatic community here, as well as members of parliament, the government, and those representing the academic, business, and cultural communities of Ottawa and especially uh, recognize Catherine White, the president of the United Nations, Nations Association of Ottawa and her colleagues. And now it is my pleasure to ask the former president of the North-South Institute, institution and the and IDRC, and currently the president of the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement and member of the CG Operating Board, Maureen O'Neill, to introduce our panel. Maureen? Thank you very much, Larry. Actually, I'm introducing Barry, who's introducing the panel. So, welcome to tonight's Global uh, Policy Forum. I think that our title, Squaring the Circle, the Millennium Development Goals, post-2015, acknowledges the complexities to be addressed by our dedicated and imaginative panel. Barry, has an extensive background in public policy, both domestic social and economic policy, as well as foreign policy. Going right back, he joined uh, the Treasury Board in 1971, uh, I think during what could be described as the heyday of the attempt to have evidence-based public policy making. And he joined Treasury Board following the completion of his PhD in economics at Brown University. Barry's experienced in both the central agency, life in central agencies, and also in line departments, as well as in foreign policy, having covered there international economic policy as Sue Sherpa for the G7 and G8, trade policy, a member of the OECD Executive Committee, and as High Commissioner to Singapore. He has been the Associate Director of the Center for Global Studies at the University of Victoria and is an adjunct professor there. Since 2003, he's been working with CG, and since 2009, as a senior fellow. Now he co-directs a joint initiative, this joint initiative, between CG and the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies to explore and recommend future directions for international development beyond the 2015 UN Millennium Development Goals. And I'm sure that you will appreciate his skillful, incisive analysis and robust sense of humor, as do I. Barry. Well, thank you very much for that, that, that kind introduction. Um, as as uh, Maureen mentioned, uh, I just have to give you a disclaimer at the beginning, because my education is in economics. <clears throat> You know, when, when, uh, when God uh, created the world, first thing he did was he created uh, the sun. But the devil was there and the devil comes. Uh, and then we have to use this, the best available data uh, to measure progress. 
because measurement uh, is critical. And a lot of our effort was spent on coming up with uh, what, what do we do about, about the indicators? What are the best indicators? Because you know the statistics are like sausages. You like them better if you don't know what's in them. Uh, indices you'll like better if you don't know what the weights are for the various elements of, of uh, the indices. Uh, ratios are easier to work with if you ignore what's happening to changes in the denominator, perhaps. Um, but on balance, you know, we, our, 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 our suggestion is that, look, it's better to measure the right thing imprecisely rather than the wrong thing very precisely. But very, basically, it's, it's a very difficult squaring the circle problem, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'll tell you what our, our basic solution was. Uh, we thought, first of all, uh, instead of being goals for the bottom billion, we should have universal one-world goals that apply to everybody. Uh, second, we didn't think that the su sustainable development goals that came out of Rio Plus 20 should be a separate exercise. These have to be merged. Uh, third, the, the goals have to have some structure that focuses on individual capacities, much like the first few goals of the existing MDGs. But we also have to have stuff on collective human capital and something on enabling institutions. We, had a, we thought we had to have, have a structure. Then the other main difference we, we suggest from present practice is that targets should not be set globally. Individual countries, for them to have ownership, should select their own targets. There should be perhaps minimum global standards, but what that target is should be set by, uh, should be left to individual countries. Um,